So, um, just to set this up, on Saturday I had no voice at all. Unfortunately, if you look, it has vaguely come back. Um, but I'm going to need some water, so hence a little bit of croakiness. Uh, so apologies for that. Um, I, I wanted to do a, a, a short uh, spell, really, to kind of pull back a couple of things um, and make a few observations that I thought were... Um, might be more relevant to the architectural audience and can I prompt set up some of the, some of the questions. Um, I hope uh, that as you've gone through, what's been obvious with the case study is that the word technical hasn't been used once this morning so far. Um, and, and that's you know, not, not been kind of just omitted. It's genuinely not part of it. It's a genuine business transformation piece. So I'll get a chance to use the technology now and see if it works. Not yet. Ah, uh, so a uh, little bit about uh, my involvement with um, uh, BAE and submarines. Um, I started uh, uh, a few years ago uh, advising Steve um, and, and came in really to do what I would have called a, a maturity assessment around enterprise architecture and strategy, looking at that space and the problems that um, he set out before. Um, and we've worked through together a number of things over the time. There's a few visuals there, that a few of those are in some of the earlier slides. Um, an architected approach, that kind of thinking, you know, kind of drawing on the whole idea of having to look at things as a whole, uh, stuff that will appeal to a lot of people in this room, that kind of big picture thinking, how do you structure that? How do you make sure things are aligned? Um, following on from that, uh, supporting him, supporting Steve around his digital strategy and, and innovation work, <coughs> uh, which uh, Steve outlined before, uh, and now into the, uh, the business transformation. Now, one of the fascinating things for me, um, I started work in the aerospace industry, um, a little company called Lucas, um, many, many years ago. Um, and so large sort of engineering metal things are really exciting to me. Um, and to be honest, this, this product... Um, here was one of the things that I found quite fascinating in that environment. Um, and I was very lucky. There's a, a, a person that we know, known as Spider. Um, uh, no idea why. Um, who took me on a tour quite a few years ago of, of, the, of the boat being made um, in, the, in, the, in the hall. Uh, and I couldn't stop grinning for about a week. Uh, it was fantastic to actually see that sort of uh, uh, setup. One thing I don't understand is... Uh, and I still don't profess to fully kind of get it, but um, language is something which I know a lot of us in the architecture forum get quite uh, obsessed with. Um, that's a boat, okay? Um, <coughs> yet they use a ship lift. Now, it's not a ship, but it's a shipyard. So I still don't understand that. Um, and I got caught out when I saw their cousins and I went to the shipyard in Portsmouth where they make ships and I referred to the large boat that was arriving, they nearly threw me out. So um, there's a lot of kind of what's a boat and a ship, and, and if you want to know, ask those guys, because I still don't understand that. Uh, one of the other parts, and I'll just put it in there, because uh, Barrow's an interesting place to work. It is a genuine shipyard. It's, it's big. It's the only place in the world I know where it rains sideways. Um, and um, when we had new starters coming up there, we genuinely put on the induction form, buy waterproof trousers... Um, so, uh, but there's some other things, and, and whilst I've been up there, I've had a chance to kind of indulge myself in some of the hobbies and cycled around and climbed around a bit of the, uh, the Lake District, because it is sunny occasionally, um, so it's a, it's a great place to be. Right, so um, I knew Ollie um, from before. I think it said he was, uh, so Ollie Wignall's the uh, operations director. Um, and um, he, I, I had a conversation with him, and uh, there's a reason for the cup of tea there. We were having a brew at the time, actually, so we were having a, a conversation over a cup of coffee, as it happens. Um, but um, uh, he was telling me he had a vision for what he wanted to do with, with the operations function. Um, and I knew Ollie, uh, and, and for me, um, I knew that that meant he had a very grand vision and it would have a lot of bits in it and he would be very excited about it. 
Um, and I'm sure these guys would recognise them, probably annoying the AV people who are wandering around too much, um, that he would be... Uh, uh, that sometimes that vision would be hard to pin down. Exactly what would they have to do? Now, in the context as well, you've got to remember, these are operations guys, I'm sure they won't mind me saying, but they like the answer, they like the solution. So they want to go straight to, what is it we've got to do, and we'll go ahead and do it. They're not people who like to sit down and think about the space of, in, and stay in the thought space for a long time. They want to get on with it. They want to get their hands, roll the sleeves up and get on with it. I think it's a, a generalisation, but I don't think it's a million miles away. Um, so one of the things I was very conscious of is that this vision simply needed to be captured. So first thing it needed, to, it needs to be written down. So w what was the vision? It was all right kind of saying, this is what it is and speaking, but it needed to be actually um, uh, written down captured so that people could start kind of doing something with it. And, and in order to do that, there needed to be some structure. Um, and uh, he's not here, so it's, he's fair game. But, you know, structure is not necessarily something in terms of the way that Ollie communicated stuff. So uh, one of the things that's useful to be able to do is to help him structure his vision so that other people could unpack it and start doing something with it, start enacting the bits, start making things happen as a result. Um, and start sharing it. And that was the whole point about elaborating it, working out what were the key parts that people had to do in order to be able to deliver his vision. So, um, what I've, I've, the conversation, this is absolutely genuine what we did. The conversation we had, he started talking about his vision and, and, and he knows way more about operations than I ever will. Um, but, uh, so we actually got into a conversation about a cup of tea. And you heard Matthew talk about boiling water, and this is where John and Matthew will probably slap their foreheads soon when they realise where the whole cups of tea and peas came from. But it was genuinely a conversation we had in his office, in Ollie's office, um, around a cup of tea. And, and we simplified and said, well, all right, if you've got a vision that you want to make delicious cups of tea for your guests, um, what do you need to do? So... Um, you know, delicious cups of tea. That's actually a formula from Leicester University for how to make a delicious cup of tea, apparently. Um, so the answer is, if you live in an operations world, you just get on and start making the perfect cup of tea. You get on with it, right? That's the first thing you do. You go straight out of the office, you say, right, I'm on that, Ollie. I'm off, right, I'm down onto the next level of the floor um, or further and I'm starting to make it. Well, the point was no. That was not what we needed to be able to do. That was not the message that... Ollie had to kind of get over and had to kind of get into the, the, all these in-flight projects that referred to, the 27 projects that, that were there and what they were trying to achieve. What she actually had to do was something, and we structured it as um, capabilities. Now, there's some translation, and I know capability is a, 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 dang, a minefield of a word, so bear with me on this one. This is how it's used or this was how it was used in this conversation only, um, not trying to make it a standard for anything else. But, you know, the value proposition that we're talking about is that the tea catering helped the guests quench their thirst by providing a delicious cup of tea. Nice little value proposition. And we kind of played with that one and wrote it on a board um, and said, and therefore, what capabilities do you need to be able to deliver that? So, actually, when you start coming back, and we frame these as abilities too, so hence you heard some of the language coming through in the pieces there, and it was the ability to boil water, the ability to be able to source tea bags, the ability to source extras, milk and sugars and whatever, the ability to brew tea, uh, ability to serve tea, that sort of thing. So, you know, those were the, the things. I genuinely had this conversation with, with Ollie um, whilst drinking coffee. Um, and then um, it was like, well, what are the resources you need underneath that? So in this conversation, we were basically saying, well, you know, if you're going to boil water, you need to have a kettle. So have you got a project that's going to make sure you've got a kettle? Um, have you got a programme of work that's going to get you your tea bags or your milk or your teapot and, and, and cutlery? But also, at the same time, because we're talking a, a you know, deep-rooted engineering business that thought in terms of solutions and answers to problems, sometimes it was a little bit about stepping back and saying... Well, actually, there might be alternatives. Um, you know, your boiling water might not be a kettle, it might be a tea urn. Um, and Morecambe and Wise joke in there somewhere. Um, 
uh, or it might be loose tea uh, rather than tea bags, or you might have uh, somebody actually serving and brewing the tea, or whatever, those sorts of things. So in other words, there are more than one way that you should be satisfying uh, some of these requirements and these capabilities. Um, so I, I know as a result of that, um, oh, I'll just go back actually. As a result of that, uh, that was what uh, sort of translated into the conversations where uh, Ollie came out and started talking about cups of tea and I'm sure that John and, and uh, Matthew will now be sitting there thinking, oh, right, that's why he kept talking about boiling water and things. But that was the, uh, uh, the point behind that. Um, so, so that was really the kind of the start. And um, Ollie was then keen to say to me, um, right, I'm going to uh, ask some, some guys to kind of do some work for me. Um, and they're going to um, uh, develop a full architected approach. Um, but I don't want you to get directly involved. That's just me. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something which, um, well, let's see whether you can do it, he kind of said. So he, he sent me a challenge. And this is a big reveal, so these guys haven't heard this. Um, but he said, this is the style that we want. So there's some patterns in there. So he wanted me to advise from afar. So I wasn't sure whether he just meant I had to stay over at the far side of the shipyard, because the shipyard's quite big, by the way, and just sort of shout every so often, or, or whatever it meant. But um, it was not to be up front and, in front, it, in, you know, and, and involved. It wasn't about getting other people to come in and say, I've got a framework, I can use it, I'm going to apply it to your problem, I'm going to tell you what you need to do. This was absolutely... These guys are going to own it. They're going to take ownership of the solution. They're going to uh, learn lessons and make mistakes. And the thing about rabbit holes was absolutely uh, vital in that Ollie wanted me to let them go down rabbit holes um, so that they didn't keep repeating them, but they understood the value of the lessons learned. Now, it's quite interesting trying to understand how many rabbit holes you let somebody go down before the foundations are completely undermined, yeah? Um, but, you know, I think there was a, a, a kind of a, a reasonable enough go in the end. Maybe one or two were too painful. But, um, but the whole point is about getting to a point of, of, of self-sufficiency. Um, and, and actually now, uh, you can see that uh, although this uh, approach was taken... Um, for one particular large area, and, and I, I'm not sure if it really came through um, as much as everybody would have seen. The sheer amount of work that these guys have done uh, is huge, and the number of people that they've engaged, and the number of workshops, and, and the rooms of paper, um, and the books of paper uh, is huge. And, you know, I mean, I want to um, extend my own personal thanks for their own kind of commitment for, for doing that um, and really using it because it, it was massive um, as well as coming and sharing it today so thanks guys for that um, but it has uh, without any um, anybody who would call themselves an architect um, become something which other parts of the business who are going through a transformation or who want to run a prog program or project of work have gone to them and said, we want to do the same thing, so can you come and do that? And I know they referenced that, but that was, you know, it has become a, a competency that they are replicating across their business model um, uh, and, and uh, without ex external, um, uh, you know, heavy guidance. Um, and then just a few pieces for me about kind of reflections on it. One was, was tailoring, um, and uh, you know, any, anybody who's, who's sort of uh, uh, been involved with the, the TOGAF spec for any length of time, or even recently, but you know, at the front it says tailor it twice, yeah? Um, tailor it for your organization and tailor it for the project you're working on. And I've always kind of um, uh, believed in that particular part of it, you know, very strongly. Um, but to see it tailored this way, really reinforced that. The value of being able to take it and tailor it and adapt the language so that it was your language, um, even if it's a little bit wrong from a kind of external point of view, um, 
uh, it doesn't matter because it was, it was what they needed to be able to do for their own use. Um, and, and tailoring it so that it worked just for business architecture is an interesting one because there's no technical architecture in there. Um, but it still works. You've still got an as-is and a to-be. You've still got uh, gap analysis. You've still got the transition and road mapping. Um, so the whole sort of philosophy and the fundamental thinking that's underneath it is there, even though it, you know, it's had to be tailored so that the letters and, and the words are, are different. Um, and, and for me, uh, as, a, as an advisor, one of the interesting parts was I had to let go of a lot of the things that I wanted to jump in on. So there are certain things I was like, oh, I wouldn't have done that. You know, I really wanted to kind of nudge some, some things one way one day or different another way. But actually, I had to kind of go, it's not my project. Um, it's not about how I would have done it. Um, this is about letting go. It's, um, uh, uh, it's a bit like uh, somebody was, uh, a colleague was recently telling me, um, you know, so take letting the trainer wheels off a bicycle for a child, you know, you can't keep pedalling it, and don't take that the wrong way, but it's somebody else has got to kind of, um, uh, you've got to let go of the things that you're worried about. Um, the, and the reason for that is because of the outcomes. So one of the big parts was uh, uh, I could see what was being, what was important to be achieved and why, and um, in how that applied back to what the business needed and therefore it was about the results and the outcomes. So actually the process that they went through sometimes was a bit different to the way that you might have wanted it to happen but the outcome was the right outcome because it was getting large buy-in, it was getting the kinds of results published and it was true all the way back up the line, line of sight, to the, to the original vision and that was absolutely key. You know, there was this ability to kind of go, we haven't just made this 27th project up. Yeah, this 27th project exists because it's delivering this capability, which is part of this vision. Um, and if, if another thing came along or somebody wanted to do something different, then it had to justify how it supported uh, addressing one of those gaps that supported delivery of the vision. And, and so the outcomes w was what it was all about. The, it was a, uh, the ends were the most important part, not the means to it, uh, in that sense. Um, and, and business architecture. Now, this, this, was, this was great for me because uh, we had a lot of conversations in, in the architecture forum around business architecture and, and you know, across the industry um, about what it is. And, and you know, as architects, we like to um, try and take a business model and, and sort of start architecting it in, in a way that feels right, you know, a bit like the old sort of systems architecture piece. Um, but when you started having things in there like workwear, it gets quite interesting because you suddenly go, oh, hang on, how does, how does what people are wearing and all the overalls and, and personal protection equipment, how does that um, fit into an architected approach? Um, and it does because it's part of the... Um, uh, uh, the selling of it, the part of the being proud in what they wear. But actually, even when you start thinking about some of the stuff we're doing around the digital strategy, um, one of the things that came back around recently was uh, looking at, at tablets and the fact that you have to have pockets in which the, the tablets might fit in. So there's a whole thing that actually these things are linked, whichever way you look at it. Um, and, the, and the last part, just to kind of put on all of this, is... Um, it, it genuinely worked. Um, you know, this is not a, it could work. Yeah? It's not a, um, you could use TOGAF to do some business architecture work. Um, it has genuinely been used to create the architecture roadmap for a, for a pure business transformation. Um, and um, I think that is, is, is hugely powerful. And, and I say, I just want to say thanks again for, for these guys who, who aren't, you know, who don't call themselves architects. Um, uh, and, you know, I asked them that question and um, they, they kind of, well, they, they let me stay in the room for a bit. Um, but, um, you know, they have done something which I think is, is hugely beneficial uh, for themselves, but also hugely beneficial for us as, uh, as a forum body to be able to, to reflect on and learn from. So, um, 
you know, my thanks really goes, goes to them. So, um, and that's it from me, thank you.